welcome to sri lanka medical association uh, for the monthly clinical meeting organized uh, joint sri lanka mel association and college of anesthesiologists uh, so this is a one and a half hour uh, exercise where we talk on uh, especially on the back pain uh, management and the treatment uh, so the main idea of these monthly clinical meetings are to share the the latest updates and the experiences the treatment modalities and update our colleagues uh, knowledge uh, so i would like to call upon the first speaker uh, for the session uh, so over to you uh, for the first speaker we can start the session now first of all i would like to thank sri lanka medical association for giving the opportunity to the college of anesthesiologists and intensivists of sri lanka faculty of pain medicine to conduct this pain management lecture our topic is beyond the surface exploring the depth of back pain diagnosis and treatment we myself dr gainival pola dr suchivani dr prasadini karuna ratna and dr disa nayak we are going to conduct this lecture during next one and a half hours we are going to do our objectives introduction to lower back pain common causes evaluation of back pain comprehensive pain management international interventional pain management back pain is the penalty for homo sapiens sapiens for their erect posture is this a major problem yes 7.5% of the global population affect with back pain 80% of adults in industrial countries have at least one episode of disabling back pain in their life by the third decade 50% of people have experienced an episode of lower back pain that required alteration in activity in spite of optimal management 5% of acute back pain progress to chronic disabling end point lower back pain is the leading cause of global disability is responsible for significant morbidity in worldwide resulting in a significant economic burden with the loss of 50 million working days each year at a cost of more than 5 billion pounds we all know international association of study of pain announced revised definition in 2020 which makes the revolution in pain management it was 1979 they have given the first definition the same iasp announced 2021 as the global year about back pain the back pain could be upper back pain or lower but common things are common lower back pain is the common thing because of the weight bearing the lower back pain is below the costal margin up to the inferior gluteal folds they can present either acute sub acute or chronic back pain the different sorts of schools describe it is acute as less than 1 week 6 weeks or less than 1 month sometimes and sub acute 1 month to 3 months and chronic as more than 3 months so they can come as acute on chronic pain as well or in a severe pain who is having chronic back pain the cause we usually described the cause as the pain generator that is origin that is anatomy the most common is simple musculoskeletal back pain which comes 95% of all patients with back pain four four to five person it is due to spinal root pain and one person is due to serious spinal pathology and as clinician it is our responsibility to exclude 
serious spinal pathologies, the, all the patients who come with back pain. The mnemonic is tuna fish. So we call it as red flag. And as I mentioned earlier, the common, most common is musculoskeletal pain, sp the next spinal root pain, and serious spinal pathology. And we can't forget, they can come with problems outside the back also as back pain. Earlier, the more than 80% of back pain had no specific diagnosis. But now, it's the other way around. More than 80% situations, we can identify the pain generator. It could be a physiological nociceptive innovation causing pain or due to pathological innovation making neuropathic pain or due to central or peripheral sensitization or learned pain, nociplastic pain. As we discussed, where the pain is called pain generator, that is the anatomy, and why the reason. It could be due to infective, inflammatory, neoplastic, degenerative, traumatic, or even nitrogenic. The anatomy can guess any cause. The anatomy, our back is constricted, constructed with muscles, ligaments, vertebral bodies, disc, facet joint, sacral iliac joint. And another important thing, even hip joint. We have seen avascular necrosis of femur, the fracture femur even can present as back pain without any hip pain. So the same thing again, but different classification. This is very important. We have to keep it in our, our mind that these causes when we see, this, see our patients. The causes, again, the different classification, it could be mechanical, lower back pain, non-mechanical, or visceral. Though this is a bit busy slide, so we, I will try to discuss these uh, causes. The mechanical, the most common, 97% is mechanical. It could be with the prevalence it is mentioned, lumbar strain is the most common, 70%. Degenerative process of the discs, facets, usually age-related, 10%. Herniated disc, 4%. Spinal canal stenosis, 3%. Osteoporotic compression, osteoporotic compression fracture, 4%. Spondylolisthesis, 2%. Traumatic fracture, less than 1%. Congenital disease, severe kyphosis, severe scoliosis, and spondylolysis, or internal disc disruption, can uh, these are the mechanical causes. So we see all these uh, cases in our clinic very commonly. And the non-mechanical spinal conditions are, it is about 1% the malignancy. It could be 0.7% overall, and the difference we have to diagnose could be multiple myeloma, metastatic carcinoma, lymphoma or leukemia, spinal cord tumors, retroperitoneal tumors, primary vertebral tumors, or else it could be very rarely infection. It is 0.01% due to osteomyelitis, septis, discitis, paraspinous abscess, shingles. And also it could be due to inflammatory arthritis, ankylosing spondylitis, psoriatic arthritis, writers, this is inflammatory bowel disease. Now we are talking more about the inflammatory bowel disease, especially with nociplastic pain and Paget's disease of bone. And visceral, as I mentioned earlier, outside the back, they can come with backache. Disease of pelvic organ, prostitis, endometriosis, chronic pelvic inflammatory disease, renal disease like nephrolithosis, pyelonephritis, perinephric abscess, aortic aneurysm, and gastrointestinal disease, the uh, pancreatitis, cholecystitis, penetrating ulcers. So keeping all these causes in our mind, we try to come to a, a pay, find out the pain generator. For that, 
we need to know our anatomy of the back. So we are having two curvatures, starting cervical, thoracic, lumbar and sacral. Even we lost this curvature, we can be in pain. And our back formed with the 33 spinal vertebras and this vertebra has body and then the pedicle and lamina making the central canal which traverses the spinal cord which covers the uh, dura mater, arachnoid mater and pia mater which is having the CSF and from the pedicle there is a superior articular process from the uh, lamina, there is an inferior articular process, forms the, these facet joints. In between these facet joints, it travels the roots of the, from the spinal cord. And in between these vertebral bodies, there are discs, which composed of annulus fibrosus and nucleus pulposus. And then the ligaments, very well known supraspinatus ligament, infraspinatus ligament, ligamentum flavum, anterior longitudinal ligament, posterior longitudinal ligament, and the muscles. There are three layers of muscles, superficial, intermediate, and deep muscles. And also from the abdominal cap, abdomen, the uh, muscles are extending to the posterior, the back, lower back. So these are the, out of these, very important muscles are latissimus dorsi, serratus posterior, and erector spinae, and which consists of spinalis longissimus, iliocostalis, and semispinalis multifidus, and quadratus lamborum. So we, when we practice, start practicing pain, we have to know these muscles. Later on, you will realize the importance of knowing these muscles. Right. And also, these muscles can have trigger points. It could be referred. So we have to uh, know these uh, trigger points. Uh, so you will realize the importance of knowing trigger points at the end of this lecture. And this disc, as I mentioned earlier, this is sometimes not kind at all. So this can go into this degeneration, dehydration, weak uh, the uh, desiccation, and uh, this bulging prolapse. If this disc uh, prolapse to the central canal above L1 can cause myelopathy. Below L1, it can cause radiculopathy. And also to the lateral canal, if this get prolapse, it also again can cause radiculopathy. This, this can get herniated, sequestrated, and causing free fragments as well. And then the uh, joints. So well-known joint is the SIJ and facets. Out of these, we, I mentioned at the beginning, we weight bear, and it is lower facet get the most the weight bearing effect. And these joints can get arthropathies and arthritis and inflammation. So, and as I mentioned earlier, not only the these back muscles, the leg, the joints, the feet, even hip. Uh, avascular necrosis and hip fractures can present as back pain. Right, then the nervous innovation. So everybody knows the sciatica and most of the time the medical professionals even whatever the back pain, even the public they tell, tell that is sciatica. So you have to keep it in mind, not all back pains are sciatica, but sciatica is very important that is sciatic nerve compression or even uh, getting the neuropathic pain with the due to different causes. And back pain and disability goes hand in hand. The disability could be physical, social, psychological, spiritual. When we are having chronic back pain, we can't walk, we can't sleep, we can't go to the job, the, our earning capacity can uh, go lost. And when all these things are happening, are psychologically not normal even we can end up in psychological depression post traumatic disorders and when all these things are happening we is high chance of us going into spiritual problems the risk factors and also the, some reinforcing factors are there the like obesity other comorbidities and occupational uh, some occupations can cause back pain and there are when you are psychologically depressed or psychological uh, problems, you are at high chance of 
ending up in this kind of chronic pain and also when you are having uh, comorbidities, medical illness and you are uh, chance, high chance of your getting uh, back pain. And especially in developed world, the reinforcing factors uh, for secondary gain, environmental, work, uh, workers' compensation, and litigations. These can cause chronic back pain. In our country, we have observed the physician knowledge deficit in areas of diagnosis and appropriate treatment can prolong symptoms and uh, uh, validate pain behavior. And most people recover from acute episode within eight weeks. Uh, and NAS guideline, that is North American Spine Society, defined the initial phase of care lasting about eight weeks. Patients remaining symptomatic after six months have poor prognosis for significant improvement. So they have uh, studied the patient worries and patient education affect this chronic back pain. 64% the they wrong movement could lead to a serious problems 60 percent think i might become disabled for a long time 51 percent avoiding movement is the safest way to prevent pain from worsening and 45 percent i wouldn't have this much of pay uh, of work something uh, dangerously wrong and 31 percent i might injure myself if i exercise and there are yellow flags and which is important, and also uh, there are different tools to assess high-risk patients. And the yellow flags are believing that lower back pain is harmful or disabling, fear and avoiding activity due to back pain, if a tendency towards low mood and isolation, or having a strong expectation that passive rather than active treatment will help. So when if patient is having yellow flags that indicate your acute lower back pain will be, can become chronic. Okay. So I would like to call the next speaker, Dr. Suchi Iwani, to continue evaluation of back pain. You have to keep, while keeping in the anatomy pain generators, and then uh, we are going to evaluate this back pain. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm going to talk about the evaluation of patient with back pain. When you are going to manage a patient with back pain, this is the most important part. Uh, to examine and to, uh, to diagnose the patient's pain condition, we have to history taking examination and investigation. All the uh, patient evaluation process going to take need sufficient time. Roughly about, we need about half an hour at least needed for evaluation of a patient with pain. So careful listening to the patient is mandatory and the, there should be empathy towards the patient and we should establish a good rapport. And when you are taking the history, we also need to interfere with the patient and ask leading questions. And we also have to find effect of pain and the, we need to find out whether there are areas to find need uh, any special attention. So, any uh, specialty has their own way of evaluating their patients. So, as pain specialist, this is the step we take to, this is the process we do in pain patient evaluation. Um, I would rather say we do history, examination, investigation and management. So, the first step is when you are going to evaluate a patient, you should have some idea about the common causes and red flags. And uh, keeping these two things in mind, only we uh, go into the next step. Um, the, so, the commonest co causes already discussed by Dr. Gayani Walpole. I have again uh, mentioned, uh, I have put these the commonest problems there she discuss all this in detail and the next thing is when you're going to see the common problems are usually common so when a patient come to us we should know we also have to find out 
uh, what are the red flags so if during our pain management we have to identify these red flags and if necessary we have to refer the patient to the relevant special, specialist or relevant area of management the red flags uh, could be uh, we can identify the red flag as a uh, symptom sign or a disease condition so the, um, the I have list out the major uh, main red flags the major trauma patient may be having a major trauma having history of major trauma or we may suspect a tumor during the in the presentation and suspected infection suspected fracture and if the patient present with the neuro deficits, neuro deficits could be autonomic neuro deficits or motor deficits or sensory deficits. Well, all these are we have to consider as red flags and patient need further evaluation and uh, refer, uh, referring the patient to the relevant specialist. And also uh, the severe pain, the, pa the severity may be not proportional to the uh, the condition but if a patient is having a severe pain again we have to uh, thoroughly uh, uh, assess the patient so history in history taking pain history taking the history we can divide into two parts the specific pain history and the other general history with the patients other general conditions uh, we do as day to day uh, history taking so uh, any patient like in when a patient come with pain there's a chief complaint and then we go into the history of presenting complaint they are the, the patient the assessment of uh, quantity or severity of or the intensity of pain is very very important because that uh, guides to our pain uh, treatment so how are we going to assess the severity or intensity of the pain we have to use pain scales for that there are two types of pain scales uh, the we commonly use the unidimensional pain scales uh, these are some of th those binary scales like it's a simplest pain scale which we are sometimes we need this like we patients say whether the patient is having pain or not sometimes when a patient come to us maybe uh, this uh, scale going to be very useful like uh, um, patient with uh, who can who can't express sometimes we have to ask whether are you in pain or not that is the binary scales and verbal rating scales like we can ask whether the patient is having mild moderate or severe um, numerical rating scale we commonly use when there's no pain is zero and when there's severe pain worst pain ever had 10 and we have put numbers from 0 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 depending on the we ask the patient to say in what you can you explain us how is your severity what is the number you can give it to the pain and there are faces rating scales where depending on the patient's facial appearance we can judge what, are, what is the severity of the pain and there are visual analog scales where there are color coding and things we the depend on the uh, the usually the worst pain is colored as red and no pain is green so in that way there are color coding pain scales and we do use multi-dimensional pain scales usually in a unidimensional pain scale we usually assess the severity of the pain also but in uh, multi-dimensional pain scales we use we assess the other aspects of pain such as emotional aspects and other pathways in all in pain pathway uh, other related pathways so McGill pain questionnaire brief pain inventory are two of those so uh, assessment of quality or nature of the pain also very important uh, such as nociceptive pain, uh, neuropathic pain and uh, when you are going to find out whether it is a neuropathic pain again we have uh, another pain scales are there to detect those like uh, pain detect questionnaire something like uh, like uh, uh, there are many actually there are many pain scales described uh, what are the neuropathic pain scales right the nature of pain so depend on the nature of pain we can get a clue 
uh, what sort of a pain, uh, the, what, where is the pain generator? Like predominant back pain with non uh, dermatomal leg pain, most likely due to internal uh, intervertebral disc disruption, sacroiliac joint pain, vertebral compression fracture, facet arthropathy, or myofascial pain syndromes. Predominant leg pain with back pain could be CRPS, uh, prolapsed intervertebral disc, uh, diabetic neuropathy, post herpetic neuralgia like conditions. So, the pain we do have to ask during the pain history whether the onset is acute or chronic, which will get some clues, and the site of pain, whether the pain is localized or diffused, radiation of the pain is very important. We then we can find out what roots are involved, and night pain usually uh, more in the inflammatory pain conditions and aggravating factors uh, like the position, which position going to increase or decrease the patient's pain and the relieving factors. Um, so, we also need to ask during the history the treatment history uh, because uh, depending on that what, how the patient is previous what sort of treatment patient has taken. So, we may have to uh, whether we have to uh, have to reduce or increase depending on the patient's pain condition and patient's family history. Sometimes patient's condition may be related to the occupational thing, uh, 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 history, uh, po the positions which we have, the patient has to use during the, his job. And the personal history is very important because, uh, and the psychological assessment also mandatory in pain patient's assessment. Um, again, the, we are using many scores for the psychological assessment, hospital anxiety and depression scale and Beck depression inventory, Hamilton depression scale, a few of those and I have in the right side of the slide I have put the HADS score which we use in our pain unit NHSL. So, the next step in patient pain, uh, back pain evaluation is the examination of the patient. Uh, so, the steps we follow there is the inspection. Uh, the general uh, we uh, in the examination the general examination is must in any system examination so in the back pain examination also we might do the general examination as we do in the other systems and we follow the uh, steps as inspection palpation the range of movement of the back and hip and neurological ex examination and there are special tests which will diagnose the diagnose the specific specific conditions. So, what are we going to inspect uh, in back pain evaluation? Inspection of the back and leg is necessary. So, we have to inspect the posture, gait, the muscles, the size, shape and the contour and the swelling whether the patient is having swelling, whether the patient has scars which will give get the clothes. Palpation also very important in back pain evaluation. The patient present with tenderness in specific area, it help us to localize the pain generators. We may be able to palpate joints and like SIJ easily palpable facet joints and uh, ligaments and certain muscles. So, we may be able to find the, uh, it is really helpful in finding the pain generators. The range of movements of hip and spine. So, in a back, lower back ache evaluation, we need to do the forward flexion, backward flexion or extension, left lateral flexion, uh, right, uh, the, the, the lateral flexion in the right side as well as and the rotation both left and right. And hip also we have to do the same again, flexion, extension, abduction and adduction. Neurological examination also necessary. So, we have to find out whether the patient is having uh, uh, any uh, sensory loss or patient is complaining of any hyperalgesia or hyperesthesia in any dermatome. Muscle power need to be checked. So, as we do in the normal day-to-day uh, -day neurological examination. And the deep reflexes, knee jerk, ankle jerk and um, 
and the superficial reflexes, cremasteric reflex, plantar reflex, anal reflex and bulbocavernous reflex. So there are special tests in uh, backache evaluation. Test for lumbar root irritation, we do the SLRT and uh, um, so uh, there are there are tests for spinal canal stenosis and tests for sacroiliac joint pain and there are tests for piriformis syndrome. So we need to perform these special tests as well during the patient evaluation. This is the straight um, leg raising test performed in the supine position. The cell RT can be also performed in the seated position as well. And this is the test which we do for the SIJ involvement which is called a Faber test or Patrick test. The next step in our evaluation is usually those what I have mentioned already history and examination usually we should be able to get the main evaluation part 90% of the diagnosis we can get from the history and examination itself. And then we have to decide the, what are the investigations we are going to do on the patients. We do blood test to find out, to exclude red flags and find out the pathology and we do also do the radiological investigation like x-ray, MRI, sometimes CT, some, when we want to visualize bone, sometimes CT is better. And we also go for nerve, uh, electrodiagnostic studies like nerve conduction studies and electromyogram. Biopsy and uh, culture may be necessary in certain patients presentations so this uh, I have put some two x-rays and uh, one MRI that x-ray shows there's a spondylolysis in um, L4, uh, in between L4 L5 vertebral bodies you can see the, the, the vertebral body slipped anteriorly and in the second x-ray we can see some wedge fractures and degenerative changes and third one, the right side one, is a MRI which shows some disvulgures and impeachment with the lower part of the spinal cord. We also do uh, interventions as diagnostic for the diagnostic purpose, and we can block certain nerves and see whether the when it, when, when there's a to find the exact pain generator. Sometimes we do have to do the interventions as a diagnostic process. So uh, like um, injection of the SIJ like synovial joint injection uh, to the SIJ sometimes before proceeding to the ablation procedures we may get a clue whether the by doing this procedure whether the patient is going to be okay before uh, going into the definitive in interventions. The diagnostic in intervention is going to be discussed by Dr. Lakshman Desanayak. So, depending on all what I said, we can make algorithm and see what are how we are going to uh, uh, diagnose the pain. So, uh, how we are going to diagnose the patient's pain conditions. I have summarized few of these there. Um, the next uh, lecture is going to be done by Dr. Prasadini Karuna Ratna. She will talk about how we are going to uh, manage a patient with back pain. Thank you. And uh, we know the gravity of the problem now. Uh, Dr. Gaini explained well how globally back pain has affected the population and though we don't have exact numbers, this condition is same in our country as well or maybe even more. Uh, so, And uh, you know how to assess the patient now with history examination and investigations and management of back pain. Uh, we we call it management because most of the time we cannot treat and cure. We have to manage, that is we have to control the symptoms and relieve pain and patient might get it again because of the etiology sometimes. So it is basically managing the back pain rather than treating. If it is acute, of course, sometimes we may be able to cure it, but in chronic 
situations. Most of the time, the back pain is managed. So, treatment of low back pain is basically three main parts. Conservative, interventional and surgical. The conservative management is we can do with pharmacology, with our drugs, psychotherapy and non-pharmacological therapy. Why we have to do use this psychotherapy and non-pharmacological uh, measures or uh, treatment options? Because this chronic pain goes with your psychological uh, element as well. The, you know the pain sensation and pain perception is two things, right? That your emotional factors, psychosocial factors, beliefs, myth, all the things come into play. That's why the psychotherapy is important. Especially depression and anxiety goes hand in hand with chronic pain. Sometimes depression and anxiety will aggravate your chronic pain and sometimes your chronic pain will aggravate uh, other psychological comp components. So it goes hand in hand. So when you are managing chronic pain patients, it should be a holistic approach. Therefore, you need multimodal or multidisciplinary uh, uh, approach, right? That you need your pain, pain, pain uh, doctors or I, at least you also can treat pain conditions but you may need other people's support like psychotherapist, uh, phys physiotherapist or uh, sometimes other social workers maybe. So it is multidisciplinary involvement and your an management also it's multimodal that you are using several drugs. You know your pain pathway from the faculty, your medical school but if you know there are several rely, uh, relies or several stations, first order neurons, second order, third order, and there are a lot of uh, neurotransmitters in, in this pathway. So you have to address all these places for a good control. That's why we use multimodal analgesics, right? So acute lower back pain, uh, Dr. Gaini mentioned that it is usually recovered within six weeks. And invasive treatment is not required in most of the conditions if there's no red flags. Treatment is most of the time conservative and it is symptom control and patient education. Because it can recur if the patient got the same position or do the same heavy work or sometimes. So patient education is very important. Uh, conservative management we are using most of the time our pain drugs and your choice of analgesics depend on the type of pain and underlying etiology. So you, I think all of you know the WHO pain ladder which was initially designed for cancer pain but we are using it for other pain conditions as well. You know the, there are stepwise uh, increase using uh, use of drugs. Step one is an opioid analgesics or your simple analgesics like paracetamol and NSAIDs. Step two, your weak opioids like tramadol and codeine. Step three, strong opioids uh, like fentanyl morphine. And step four, your interventions. So we know that we assess the pain severity 0 to 10 in a numerical scale. So we use that to stand which step we need to start treatment. So if the patient's pain is very severe, we start from step three and we come down to step one once the patient is settling. So it is not an ascending ladder. Sometimes we descend on this ladder and sometimes we step into step T two if the patient's pain is moderate, like that is about pain score four, five, six. And we can increase if the patient's pain is not settled and we can come down once the patient's pain is settled. So it is assessment, treat or manage and reassess. 
and always reassess and either escalate or de-escalate. And uh, in other thing we are managing, I said, that is depend on the type of pain, the character or the what sort of pain patient is having. You know the nociceptive pain, that is the patient will complaining of aching, pressing type of pain. It is a sharp pain sometimes and its nociceptive pain is well demarcated. You can find the way from where it is coming from and no tingling or burning uh, features which are more neuropathic and the most common causes are facet joint pain, sacroiliac joint pain, myofascial pain and ligament sprain. So this type of pain is nociceptive pain and most of the time it will respond to your NSAIDs and because it is it has analgesic and anti-inflammatory action. They are very highly effective but their side effect is the problem. So gastric irritation, patients with having renal impairment or coagulation problems on uh, are limited in using NSAIDs. Anyway, in these and NSAIDs should be restricted to a short duration for at nearly uh, one week, like right. So you should not prescribe over and over again uh, the NSAIDs. And patients who are having other chronic conditions like diabetes, hypertension, they have uh, undiagnosed renal impairment sometimes. So in these situations, you must be extra caution in prescribing these drugs. Though their renal functions are normal, they may have renal impairment. So be careful when selecting the patients for NSAIDs. So paracetamol, it's an analgesic you everybody knows but should not be prescribed as a monotherapy because it might not be effective. So it's good with NSAIDs and uh, in combination. So in the first WHO pain ladder, first step is simple analgesics. So you can use in pain scores like one, two, three pain. Uh, these two drugs most of the time together will be effective. And if the pain score is severe, right, 7, 8, 9, like pain, you can use opioids in acute stage, but limited place in uh, chronic back pain management. In acute pain, cancer-related pain, and severe chronic pain as a vicious cycle breaker, we can use. So, you know, weak opioids like tramadol, you can use as a monotherapy or in combination with NSAIDs or paracetamol, but not for long-term use, right? Strong opioid can use in cancer-related pain, back pain, but not in other chronic pain conditions, right? And uh, the you know the side effects, tolerance, depression, uh, respiratory depression, sedation, all these problems are there, but if you use the drug dose carefully, you can use these drugs effectively. But always explain the patient and the relatives about the side effects. Especially tramadol, uh, the nausea, vomiting, constipation, and risk of addiction, you have to keep in mind. But it is useful in moderate to severe pain to control the symptoms and then come down to uh, NSAIDs or paracetamol. So it is used mainly to reduce the severe pain to a lower level. So what is pain relief we call pain score less than 3 in functional state. That is what we need to achieve. So neuropathic pain you will identify neuropathic pain as tingling, numbness, burning, shooting pain, and electric shock-like pain. So it causes 
may be acute radicular pain or entrapment neuropathies. So nerves are uh, irritated and they will get, uh, they will generate pain uh, sensations. There are several mechanisms which are complex, but neuropathic pain is a useless pain. That is, nociceptive pain rather is a useful pain and it is in it indicates that you need some rest or some uh, damage can happen if you keep on straining the uh, area continuously but neuropathic pain is something useless pain and it it's agonal pain which uh, prevents your day-to-day -day activities and it is mainly managed with neuropathic drugs. You know, in the pain ladder, if you see it again, right? There is a part called adjuvant drugs, right? So these adjuvant drugs are mainly used in chronic or the neuropathic pain, right? Anticonvulsants, antiepileptics. Patient, uh, drugs like ketamine and lignocaine, local anesthetics. So they are these drugs initially made for some other illness, but later we have found that it has some analgesic effect. And you know that with the nerve uh, involvement, muscle spasms can occur. Sometimes drugs like baclofen or tizanidine will relieve the spasms and it will help to relieve the symptoms. So the as I mentioned earlier, the pharmacological management, uh, the neuropathic drugs uh, are the mainstay of treatment in neuropathic pain or chronic uh, neuropathic pain. So gabapentin, pregabaline, uh, like uh, drugs, anti-epileptics and SNRIs or antidepressants, tricyclic antidepressants and topical agents, local anesthetics are used. So gabapentin, we are using very commonly. It's because of their side effects. We start with a low dose usually, 100 milligrams nocte and gradually increase. So you can go up to maximum dose of 3,600 milligrams per day. And, but be careful about the side effect, dizziness, drowsiness, nausea, and vomiting sometimes. And these drugs, be careful in renal impaired patients as well. So you have to use low doses in renal impairment. But it is very effective in neuropathic pain. Pregabaline also in the same group, but you have to but it has a good side effect profile and renal profile. Again, it has to be start with a low dose and gradually increase. And always acknowledge the patient about the side effects. Amitriptyline is the common, commonly available in the hospitals. Duloxetine, venelaflexine are sometimes not available, but amitriptyline most of the time available. And it is you are using low dose uh, for uh, as an adjuvant, right? And the uh, side effects, dry mouth and drowsiness, you should inform the patient. And psychological interventions, so need proper counseling and uh, depression management and anxiety management, and especially patient education is very important in chronic back pain and cognitive behavioral therapy which is done by the psychiatrist or the psychotherapist it is a way of the patient education how to manage pain uh, and live uh, to live with that pain that doesn't mean patient has to suffer but how patients cope up strategies are improved in cognitive behavioral therapy that's why we said it is multidisciplinary involvement is invo important in pain management and there are a lot of non pharmacological methods uh, especially physiotherapy uh, they are we are referred to these places if the patient is having back pain. 
So the back pain more than leg pain, usually it may be due to this degeneration like facet joint arthropathy, myofascial pain or sacroiliac joint uh, arthropathy. So reassurance and patient education is very important and strengthening exercises and specific exercise treatment, right? Stretching of tight areas. Though we don't know these things, we can refer them to the physiotherapist and we can get their help to do. We, we can say the physiotherapist that we need these things to be done and we need your help. So they will, we know the things that what we need to do and they can do the technically their part to improve the patient's muscle strengthening. strengthening. An aerobic activity and transelectric nerve stimulation, it is helpful for temporary pain relief. This temporary pain relief is also important because it will break the vicious cycle. And massages, we, uh, the, the, those things are done by sometimes in some units by the nurses, especially in my unit, Cancer Institute, Maharagama. Nurses are doing all these uh, techniques and they have a massaging unit as well. So patients are, get uh, benefit from that. So if you have uh, severe pain, at, at least you can counsel them, uh, contact them or get the advice or you can uh, ask pain management nurses, are, if they are in your unit, uh, in your hospital, they are help. If you're, but we have to know these facilities are available in some places and these, these options are available as a pain relief method. And complementary movement therapies like yoga, pilates, these are very popular in some places, yoga, and sometimes people do it by themselves, so you can encourage them for those things. And be careful, your our wrong advice or wrong management of physiotherapy can aggravate the pain as well. So with knowledge, we have to interfere uh, or introduce those things. And leg pain more than back pain, sometimes patients come with more leg pain and it could be lumbosacral or radiculopathy. So most of the time resting will relieve the symptoms and lumbar spinal stenosis, uh, the flexion-based exercises, stretching and aerobic conditioning, all these conditions, all these non-pharmacological me measures will be helpful. And non-lumbar spine causes of radicular leg symptoms, that is lumbar spine is not the pain generator. It could be somewhere else, joint disorders, soft tissue disorders, those things also can be managed with physiotherapy. And interventions, we do surgical interventions in the presence of red flags and surgical management is the treatment of choice. And failure of conservative management and if the pain is severe, surgical interventions may be needed. And most of the time in our pain centers, we do interventional pain management. And if the patient's pain persists for more than six weeks without or with treatment, and patient's pain score is more than four, five, four, five six, that is not mild pain, it is moderate to severe pain, and it, it is poorly responding to treatment with drugs, and if the patient's side effects of drugs are more, then we have to go for uh, interventions. Uh, so that's summary I want to tell that in chronic back pain, your opioid usage is limited only for cancer pain and acute pain. In severe pain, usually uh, chronic severe backache, you can use for a short time to break the vicious cycle. But other than that, chronic opioid usage is not indicated in uh, backache management. So talk more about interventional pain management. I uh, invite Dr. Lasman Disanayaka, head of the Faculty of Pain Medicine. He will uh, give you an elaborate lecture on interventional pain management. Over to you, Lasman.
good afternoon everybody thank you very much prasadini and the sri lanka medical association for giving this opportunity to talk on interventional pain management so interventional pain management as you know now after your comprehensive analysis and the diagnosis of the pain uh, conditions you manage with the uh, medical and non pharmacological non and non pharmacological management but you come to a point where you cannot manage these patients pain where the Interventional pain management is important. So, uh, during my short presentation, I will try to uh, uh, elaborate on uh, interventional pain management and share my knowledge and experience with you as a pain consultant worked in a National Hospital Sri Lanka. So, I'll going to uh, talk basically on. basic interventions as well as advanced pain interventions so what is interventional pain medicine interventional pain medicine is a uh, fill the gap between pharmacological non and non pharmacological management and surgical management the gap between these two because the most of you don't like to undergo surgical interventions for the painful conditions so if you don't like surgery it's the pay interventional pain management option these are minimally invasive procedures for the last few decades this sub developed as a sub specialty it's a very well developed sub specialty in other parts of the world so but we are at a very primitive stage in this interventional pain medicine so it not only apply to the back pain management it apply to the uh, most of the other uh, pain chronic pain conditions there are interventions we could be we can do in and if effectively this is evidence based practice so there are very good evidence very good case reports so how we do intervention pain management and efficacy of the interventions so uh, so uh, i go through this slide green area i have mentioned about what are the intervention we can do for the back pain conditions there are so many interventions for the back pain so in brief i can say uh, after correct diagnosis so we have to decide whether it's a passat problem it's a disc problem or radiculopathy or any other conditions which need interventions so uh, sorry so uh, principles of percutaneous interventions uh, any interventional procedures has certain principles to adhere so we have to know the objective of the procedures for what which conditions we are doing the procedures uh, we talk about most of the pain conditions about 10% of the pain conditions chronic pain conditions need interventions not all the conditions we do interventions and patient uh, consent is mandatory in addition we have to have good knowledge about anatomy and pleuro anatomy and devices we are using for the interventions and for that this is like day case surgical procedure we need staff training and the other facilities for the safety of the patient so standard monitoring facilities as well as sedation facilities for some patients and cooperative patients is important so if we see these slides you can see the anatomy of the back and uh, pleuroscopic anatomy on the other side so we should know where our needle is going what is the end point of the needle and what are the drugs we are depositing uh, uh, in on patients so preparation of the patient this uh, main center we are doing interventions national hospital sri lanka in addition there are few centers we are doing basic interventions so here well developed pain unit they assess the patient physically and psychologically and they do basic investigations like mri ct mandatory for certain procedures the same time as previous speakers mentioned comorbidities assessment is vital before the procedures so patients are monitored during the procedure these are few of our patients we did uh, certain procedures and trained staff and facilities for the post operative observation is needed in national hospital we don't have pain wards but we have surgical colleagues supporting us to send the patients to the ward because we have some uh, complications we have had experience some complication 
motor blocks of the epidural so we should have post uh, procedure facilities so tools and equipment is needed uh, for the advanced procedure we need uh, the advanced equipment basic procedures we can do even without equipments uh, fluoroscopes is mandatory and ultrasound machines radio frequency generators uh, different needles and the scope pumps and ports these are the basic equipments and you can see the some of the equipment but unfortunately we don't have certain equipment in our unit so we have to move forward to get this equipment and develop this specialty so uh, what are the basic in interventions we do uh, every anybody of you can do this intervention in your hospital without much facilities uh, the trigger point injections uh, as uh, guy mentioned like pain come for the muscles there are trigger points we can inject local anesthetic and steroids the trigger point to break the pain cycle this is the purpose and epidural steroid injections already most of the anesthetists are doing epidural steroid injection so there is uh, there's a evidence to support this steroid injections passage joint injection nerve root blocks sacroiliac -like joint injections these are the basic procedures actually most of us can perform these procedures without much difficulties a little bit about the epidural injections epidural injections are about most of the procedures we are doing epidurals uh, is indicated the lower lumbar disc herniation and disc de degenerative diseases so uh, there are uh, class b evidence for this uh, epidural injection as you know lumbar epidural space is a very narrow space about two three to five millimeter so so you can deposit your drugs uh, basically what we do is steroid deposition with some uh, local anesthetic I don't know which uh, steroid you are using this one but current guidelines and current practice they recommend to use dexamethasone because methylprednisolone and dexamethasone both the particulate substances but dex uh, dipomedrol can cause emboli when we uh, do the epidural injection we don't know it can go to the blood vessels and cause thrombosis then it can affect the blood supply of the spinal cord and can lead to serious consequences so uh, recommended is a dexamethasone because it's a port soluble one it doesn't cause any emboli embolic phenomena in the blood vessels so some people use tramsinolone as well so uh, what are the ways of doing epidural and conventionally ways we do with the seated position uh, but our patients we see these patients are very uh, problematic patients their spine is not straight and you might not be able to find the spine very easily right they are osteoporotic degenerative disc and disc prolapse so uh, interlamina approach we do uh, with the c arm guidance x-ray guidance then you can see the space clearly even uh, cervical epidurals we can do with the x-ray guidance very easily because you can see the the epidural space your contrast is spread very uh, clear and you know where you deposit your drugs interlamina epidurals uh, uh, the transforaminal epidural are more specific technique uh, the, in this technique we focus a particular nerve root where the pain comes the exiting nerve root is blocked this procedure always done under c arm guidance with the contrast so they can you can see the spread uh, otherwise you might uh, deposit your drugs into blood vessel or some other place so in any procedure if you find difficult uh, complaining of pain during injection you have to stop the procedure and see what is the cause of the pain right uh, the, the you see the current evidence transforaminal epidural are more efficacious and more uh, recommended uh, more evidence based practice to the transforaminal epidural rather than the interlamina epidural and this one we can do at several levels so we have the nerve root involvement l4 l5 levels and the two different levels you can do this block on the fluoroscopic guidance these are the some of patients we performed in our center so uh, the other basic intervention is the passage joint mm, about 15 percent of back pain due to passage joint problem passage arthropathy so this can be easily cured so 
passage on use is supplied by the two branches from the upper dorsal rama and the imperial low upper rama by the medial branch so either we can do a passage on injection or medial branch block uh, with the fluoroscopic guidance or sometimes now they use with the ultrasound guidance as well so uh, sacral joint injections also a bit of easy technique uh, even with the ultrasound guidance or with the cm guidance can be done so it's very effective uh, in terms of the patients having sacral joint pain so uh, quickly i'll go through some of the advanced interventions they are called minimal invasive technique is more like uh, renal uh, surgery they do through the keyhole this something like that so minimal invasive technique unfortunately we don't have facilities to do these minimal invasive procedures in sri lanka at the moment some centers did some uh, surgeons for have performed several uh, in minimal invasive procedures in sri lanka also right so uh, one is uh, also on this the that procedure depend on the stages of the disc pro herniation if the disc is contain disc uh, with the central degeneration so there are particular procedures if the disc is extruded as equivalent the procedure may be different so for example they do ozone ozone injection to the disc or intradiscal radio frequency thermal ablation so this other one called uh, biculoplasty and so many other laser treatment or this decompression all these procedures are widely performed in most of the countries uh, in the ozone nucleus is what happen is they inject to the, uh, the ozone to the central disc and nucleus get uh, sink on and the pain is reduced by uh, reducing the edema and compression of the nerve so uh, this done under fluoroscopic guidance in the, as a day case procedure so this are uh, other type of procedures uh, unfortunately we are not doing these procedures just to introduce what are these procedures endoscopic procedures this procedure is also like uh, doing the percutaneous nephrolithotripsy so uh, under local anesthesia in a theater settings they do this procedure they can remove the certain type of disc not almost all the type of disc cannot be uh, removed by the endoscopically especially certain patients uh, who are not willing for the surgical procedure or patients are very unstable for the surgery these are very good options so spinal cord stimulators are used even in our country they are used this one this is a very good thing for the uh, pale back pain syndrome condition like pale back pain syndrome no surgical options even medical options you treat with the medication lot of side effects still pain is not under control uh, this is very good uh, grade one evidence are there for the spinal cord stimulation uh, for the uh, the pale back pain syndrome done under local anesthetic so this uh, electrodes insert in the epidural space this a uh, pulse generator so what they do is, is uh, apply the principles of gate control theory so it modulate the pain at the spinal cord level so intrathecal pump this not used per se as for the back pain but cancer related back pains and disseminated back pains with secondaries intrathecal pump is useful it uh, either opioids or baclofen can be used to the pump so vertebral plasty is another technique uh, this technique for the osteoporotic fractures under local anesthesia they cement the uh, spine uh, as a pain management procedure so radio frequency ablation is a very good and easy can easily performed technique very effective here what we do is we apply a current like diatomy uh, to the nerves particular nerve is not permanently damaged it's a temporary pain uh, modulation is modified radio frequency ablation uh, fortunately we have radio frequency ablation at nhsl also but we are struggling with the getting the needles so this machine uh as a pulse generator and then the current uh, we apply the current to the uh, particular nerve with the uh, ultrasound or fluoroscopic guidance so 
Uh, there are different type of radio frequency ablation, the pulse radio frequency ablation, and the normal radio frequency ablation. So, uh, radio frequency ablation can be very well documented. It's very useful in the SI joint as well as a passage joint. Radio frequency ablation. So, very good evidence for these two uh, passage joint and the radio frequency ablation, the SI joint radio frequency ablation. It's not very difficult also. Uh, so, I just go through some of the evidence available uh, for these interventional procedures. Interlamina steroid injection uh, as a 2B evidence, but uh, transporaminal injection as a 2B plus evidence is very good. And uh, epidural lysis and epidural scope has very good evidence. Epidural scope is not with us at the moment, right? So, uh, RF ablation to the passage joint and the SI joint also have shown very good evidence, right? So, uh, for your interest, I will give some cases. In these cases, uh, so you can see the importance of having interventional procedure in certain patients. Uh, Case 1, this patient complained lower, chronic lower back pain with radiation and undergone several surgery two times, but patient's pain is increasing day by day. And they have gone to several consultants and lost, of, lost pain in the uh, faith in medical management, right? So, what is the option this patient? Because patient doesn't like surgery, he has undergone surgery and patient's not rely on the medical management. So, we are clearly the intervention pain management important in this type of patients. So, we will recommend this transporaminal epidural injection and epidurolysis for this type of patient. So, next case, patient is uh, case 2. Uh, this patient suffering from lower back pain with radiation to the buttock and thigh, uh, not to the lower limb. Pain increase in with the rotational movements, has no dermatomal pattern. What is the diagnosis? Obviously, this is the passage, passage joint related pain. So, uh, non steroids and other medication has short term benefit. So, patient having passage arthropathy, so, best option is radio frequency ablation of the passage joint. Or oh, initially, if you are not sure, as Sujivani mentioned, we can do the diagnostic uh, block to the passage joint to get the correct diagnosis. If the diagnosis block is positive, you can go for the uh, radio frequency ablation. Uh, this case, patient having severe low back pain without radiation, CT shows severe osteoporotic compression fracture at L2 level. So, this patient is a good candidate for vertebral plasty. So, uh, this patient having L5 S1 disc herniation, suffering severe pain lower back for the six months and his diabetic hypertensive has a ejection price twenty one percent and he is not a candidate for surgical options. So these are the type of patients who will benefit from the disectomies, percular disectomies as I mentioned earlier. Okay. So to uh, conclude my presentation uh, this way forward in pain management in Sri Lanka so, what the things we have to do? We have to increase, improve our knowledge and attitudes towards the interventional pain medicine. Training people and personal certification is important. So, and in addition, even though we have this knowledge and facility, the attitude, we don't have facilities to do certain things. So, we can either buy basic equipments or we can use by the used equipments from other centers. Uh, to improve these um, facilities and we should also have guidelines and protocols so assess what we are doing so uh, as a take home message I would like to say back pain is a common problem common conditions and a very challenging to manage so we need uh, to exclude red flags and first instances before you start in the treatment. Back pain need a multidisciplinary approach in the pain management which include pharmacological, non-pharmacological and the interventional options. 
thank you very much for listening so uh, these are the few of our references and uh, forum open for discussion you can ask questions the next 10 minutes thank you very much As Dr. Lakshman Disanayaka mentioned, if any of you have any questions, uh, the floor is now open and you may either uh, type it in the chat box or on the speaker and ask if you have any. This is regarding uh, inter the intervention or the participation of other disciplines in the pain management, like the uh, importance of uh, uh, nurses and physiotherapists getting involved. What do you have to say about it, somebody? At, the, at present, the status of that in Sri Lanka, so that the audience will come. Yes, uh, currently at the National Hospital as well as uh, Apeksha Hospital, both we have multidisciplinary team and psychiatry's psychological help. And when uh, we diagnose these pro uh, other problems like physical, social, psychological, spiritual, we are having excellent support from the psychiatry uh, unit, uh, uh, Colombo uh, Prof unit, as well as psychological support, as well as social worker. There is there are different social workers appointed island-wide and we do have all the names uh, registered in our unit and then uh, we can get the help and also especially we have to tell the temple. So when we detect the problems like uh, financial support and uh, the, uh, the other uh, social support, the temple help us as well as uh, definitely when we uh, diagnose red flags, uh, we need uh, the maybe a surgical, orthopedic surgeons, neurosurgeons opinion, and uh, physiotherapy. So there are different, uh, the, our unit separately, the, there are physiotherapy help, as well as uh, uh, Apeksha Hospital, I think uh, um, uh, physiotherapy, uh, we can we refer them to, and especially Apeksha Hospital, uh, we get the, good support from uh, mindfulness uh, as well as uh, the, uh, uh, the meditation, mindfulness programs and uh, uh, conduct uh, with the uh, uh, combination with the psychiatry unit. And uh, actually uh, both, uh, uh, I can't comment on the other hospital in Sri Lanka, but uh, Apeksha Hospital and National Hospital, we do have excellent uh, multidisciplinary approach uh, currently. I'd like, to, I'd, like to add some. I'd like to add something as a consultant in Apeksha Hospital. We have, a, as Dr. Kaini mentioned, uh, we have multidisciplinary uh, management facilities, relaxation unit, yoga, and uh, distracting therapy, music therapy, art therapy, those things are happening at the moment. And there's a good trained nurses for massaging uh, and relaxation unit. And also the Faculty of Pain Medicine has trained nurses island-wide. I think they have uh, trained three batches at the moment, nearly 100 or more than 100 nurses. They got all the theory knowledge and this practical knowledge, especially the non-pharmacological measures, they are in island-wide. There are a few um, drawbacks that they have, don't have facilities to release and from their units and do practice, but in some stations, they are doing it well. And especially the psychiatrist, psychotherapist, and the physiotherapist, they give 
uh, immense support for non-pharmacological measures. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you once again. And in the absence of any further questions, I would like to thank the College of Anth Anesthesiologists and Interventivists of Sri Lanka for having this comprehensive discussion on exploring the depth of back pain diagnosis and treatment. And now I'd like to call upon Dr. Sajid Edri Singha, Secretary Sri Lanka Medical Association, uh, to hand over the tokens of appreciation. I would like to invite Dr. Gaini Valpola. Dr. Indi Champika Sujivani. Dr. Prasadini Karuna Ratna. And Dr. Lakshman Disanayaka. Thank you once again, and thank you all of you for gathering with us today. Hope to see you at the next monthly clinical meeting as well. Thank you.